right, we're getting started here. Another Dr. B music theory. Let me just double check here, make sure everything is coming through by checking my laptop and it looks good, it looks good. All righty, so we are live. Dr. B here for some more music theory. It's good to be joining you. It's, it's the summer for me, which means I don't have as busy schedule, teaching schedule as I normally do, giving me a little bit more time to spend uh, talking about music theory. So I'm gonna be trying to do this every other week, every other Saturday, and uh, present some a topic. I'm gonna start off with some topic and then open it up for, for questions. So one thing that you uh, may have noticed is I just uploaded a video this morning, which was actually a birthday gift from my lovely wife. Uh, I woke up one morning and she said, oh, have you checked your Facebook wall? Seen what's there? And I said, no, I haven't. She said, no, I think you should do that. And you should go check. And so I look and I start watching this video of Penn Jillette from Penn and Teller the magic show in Vegas. We had gone and seen it a couple of years ago. We listened, I listened to his podcast periodically. So he starts talking, I'm like, oh look, it's Penn Jillette. And then he starts saying, Dr. B. And I said, whoa, what's going on? I was super confused. But it was this, it was this actually, this, this company called Cameo uh, that, that allows you to write in and have celebrities make a personalized video message for someone. So she had written them and said, hey, Penn Jillette, could you make a video wishing, wishing my husband happy birthday and pretending that you're a huge fan of Dr. B Music Theory? So uh, it's not a real endorsement, but I actually think he went to the website and looked at the music theory videos that you all are looking at uh, because the way he described the things I covered, it's, it's legit. And what's, what makes it particularly appropriate that this was something my, my wife had Penn Jillette do is that he has he plays jazz bass and so before his magic shows in Vegas he'll usually have a, a live pianist playing and if he's got time and, and the energy and everything works out he'll come out and play a few tunes on his bass before the actual magic show gets started so he does love music he's he's a smart inquisitive curious guy so although he is not giving an endorsement officially of a Dr. B I would like to officially endorse Penn Jillette of Penn and Teller. I've seen their show in Vegas. It's so good natured, witty, fun. Uh, I've listened to his podcast. I endorse both Penn and Teller as well as Cameo. It's a really interesting website where you can get celebrities and so it makes a great gift for people. I know that I was like laughing and crying. I was so happy that, you know, Penn Jillette was giving a shout out to Dr. B Music Theory, even if it was through this, this website. So anyways, what I'd like to start with talking today was a question that was asked uh, two weeks ago, which was the idea to do more analysis of Bach chorales. And we know that Bach is kind of our, our foundation in, in contemporary music theory as to what we're going to do, how it, how it should be done. So I picked the beginning of one of his chorales, and I'm going to step to the side here and let you all take a look at it. Chorale number 179, Wachet auf, ruft uns die Stimme. And so this is, I'm going to be going through a couple phrases, phrase by phrase, looking at it with you. But this would be worth you trying to uh, see how quickly you can analyze this. I do say speed counts. It's not sufficient just to be able to figure it out eventually. You actually want to be able to utilize this knowledge and able to, in order to do that, there's a time factor. Uh, both in terms of practical application, if you're performing or you're having a rehearsal and someone has a question about something and you want to look at the score and you want to use your music theory to see if all the notes are correct. Uh, and I had exactly this situation happen just this week. I, I am uh, in the process of uh, trying to republish some music that is no longer in print, historical music from the 19th century, as part of my Music of the Gilded Age project. And... Uh, I'm look, I've looked at a per, certain part of the score and it had uh, a B, B diminished triad in root position. And I compare, and it compared it to another spot of the piece where it was a G7 in first inversion. And so it was an inconsistent, but there was no reason for it to be inconsistent. So you have to ask yourself, well, which one of these is correct? And so using my music theory, I know that a diminished triad in root position is very uncommon, whereas a seventh chord, a major minor seventh chord in first inversion is super common. 
So using my music theory, I helped to come to the right conclusion in terms of editing this historical document. It's a handwritten score. And so if I want to publish it and try to make it as legit as possible, I have to be aware that, you know, a composer could make mistakes in the copying. They're going fast. They, they miss something, right? The job of an editor is to catch those mistakes. And there, using my music theory uh, was super helpful. So I've been kind of stalling here, as, as I'm hoping you are all looking at this example and trying to determine how you would analyze it and how quickly you can analyze it. But let's get started together. If you're watching this uh, through the archives, you can pause it and try to do your, your analysis before I launch into mine. But here we go for all of those watching live. So first thing, what key are we in? Three flats, it's usually E flat major or C minor. Keep in mind, sometimes you'll get excerpts on a music theory test where the key signature isn't the key, either the, the major or the relative major or the relative minor. And that's because it's an excerpt and it's modulated. That's a little tip, uh, a trick that can get, get a lot of people confused and I understand why. But in this case, we start with an E flat major triad. That's pretty pretty good indicator that we're actually in the key of E flat. I, always, I scanning this, I see one accidental and A natural here. This A flat I hear, see at the end is restoring the accidental, so that's not, that's a diatonic note where this is the only chromatic pitch. I'm pretty convinced we are an E flat major. Oh, that is a dead pen. Let's try, let's try this one. All right, so E flat major, and I always indicate this under the key signature. I then see E flat, G, B flat, E flat. That is an E flat major triad, so I'm going to write the lead sheet symbol up there, and that is Roman numeral one in the key of E flat. Another tip, when you analyze the next chord, if there's a note that starts that's sustaining, it still counts. And a lot of times students will forget, oh, they'll start looking here and they'll be like, oh, I don't see anything. It's just this B flat, E flat, G. It must be a one chord in second inversion. No, it's not. It's a one chord in root position. The E flat is being continued. Now, typically when you're doing an analysis, you don't rewrite the exact same chord from B to B. So what's happening here is this is simply a revoicing of the one chord, going from one version of a one chord in root position to another version of a one chord in root position. So I don't need to do anything other than move on to the next, next note. So here, um, and I'm going to take a, a, a look at this, we got E flat, E flat, G, B flat we're still on E flat major triads. So it, we're still going here. So nothing to do, nothing to change. Then here, this G on the and of three, technically that we could call that a one six, but here the question of harmonic rhythm comes in. Okay. Harmonic rhythm is how frequently are the chords changing? With Bach, it is often in something like this, the quarter note. Okay, and this is in 4-4, four, four. I neglected to write that. It's typically the quarter note, but not always. Sometimes it's the half note, sometimes it's the eighth note. In this case, the harmonic rhythm hasn't changed for one, two, three beats, right? But it's the beginning of the piece. So the beginnings of the piece, beginning of a piece can sometimes take a little, like it warms up. So it's not uncommon that you might have uh, an elaboration of a single one chord at the beginning of a piece, and then the real harmonic rhythm kicks in. But there's no reason to think that it's the eighth note, given what started. So this is just, we kind of ignore this, this change of inversion, and we just consider this as an arpeggiation. This, this E flat, G, B flat is an arpeggiation of the tonic triad. However, when we do get to the B flat, we now get an actual new chord, B flat, D, F, and this dotted quarter is still there. So don't forget about it as you look up. Remember what I said about sustained notes carrying through. Don't forget them. That is a B flat major triad. And when we rearticulate the B flat, that's for rhythmic purposes. Keep in mind that when we're composing something, and we're going to talk a little bit about the rhythm of this, there's not only the harmonic aspect, but there's a melodic and rhythmic aspect. So Bach could have just gone B flat and then another quarter note, but it would I mean, after 
that many quarter notes in a row, it might get boring. So what does he do? He, he changes up the rhythm to give it a little rhythmic interest, to give it the melody a little bit more character. So if this is a B-flat major triad, this would be a five chord. And then we have this A-flat here. Now, with this A-flat, and I'm going to use a different color to, to indicate this, we have to ask ourselves, is this a B flat seven chord with A flat in the bass, meaning we have a, we, we, we kind of turning into it, or is that A flat simply a passing tone? And in, in the lessons that I have up on this channel, we talk about, or uh, I talk about how the origins of the, the, the like the five seven chord is exactly from this. It starts off as just a triad, and then the seventh, it, it can function both ways, right? Or in this case, as we have it voiced, right? It's a... And so the question is, what is how does your ear hear it, right? How does your ear hear it? Does it hear it as a new chord, or does it hear it as a passing tone? So let me play for you the beginning, and this is where you need, you need to combine your ear training with your theory. So we have it. I'm going to play it a little, you know, I'm not a great pianist, so forgive me if the rhythm is not perfect, but uh, let me try that again. So let me just play that and stop at that, that after that A flat. We're asking ourselves, does it sound like a change of chord or a, simply a passing tone? I'm sorry, I'll have to do a better job for you than that. Yeah. I think it sounds like a passing tone. I think we've established quarter, 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 chord change. So that, that emphasis of that very clear rhythmic structure, even though the chord's not changing, does not set up eighth notes being that. So I'm just going to call it a five, five chord. We're going to call this a passing tone. So the best way to, to do this is you circle it and you indicate what kind of non-core tone it is. Since this is in the bass, I write it below. If this was in the tenor, I'd write it right here uh, above the tenor line. If it was in the alto, I'd write it right below the alto note. If it was in the soprano, I'd write it right above the soprano note. So where I'm writing that and in, in indicating the non-core tone is, is as close to the, the soprano, alto, tenor, or bass voice as possible. So it's really clear. All right. So... Moving forward, we have G, E flat, G, B flat. Well, this is an this is an E flat major triad. So I write that here with G in the bass. So this would be a one six chord. We then have this F here, and chances are it's a another passing tone, right? This, is, this idea of passing tones is something Bach uses a lot, especially in the bass, to kind of give the bass this kind of forward motion and some kind of melodic rhythmic interest. So let's just double check F, A flat, G, B flat. Well, that, that really doesn't make any kind of common chord that we're familiar with. So it's probably going to be heard exactly like what I said as a passing tone. Now. Let's take a look at our next chord, E flat, B flat, F, B flat. Well, that's exceedingly confusing, all right? So that, that's, that's not like any chord we know either. Let's take a, take a look at it, E flat, F, B flat. Now, I, I put them all into one octave. This is not a, a sus2 chord or, or an at, you know, there's, you know, it's a, we have a double B flat, an E flat, so this is a spot where it, you could get easily confused. 
Because that doesn't make, you know, it's like, it's almost, if this F was a G, it would be, if this was a G, then it would be a, an E flat major triad. And if this E flat was a D, it would be a B flat major triad. Um, that would make a lot more sense. But let's look forward, right? So when you get to a spot like this, don't get stuck. Take a look at it and be like, huh, that doesn't make sense. Then look forward. Because sometimes what happens next is going to clarify where you're at. Well, look, that E flat does become a D. So if we just look at like the and of two, we have the D, B flat, F, B flat. That's, that's a five chord in first inversion. That, that makes a lot of sense. So that's exactly what's happening, right? We have a B flat major triad with D in the bass. It's a five, six chord. And we have an accented non-chord tone. And this can really, I mean, this is like, if you're not ready for this, an accented non-chord tone can really be confusing. You can spend a lot of time just being like, what's going on there? And it's just another passing tone. So it's two passing tones in a row. So normally when we, at the most basic level, when we're looking at non-chord tones, we go from chord tone, non-chord tone, chord tone immediately. But this is Bach, it's a little bit more sophisticated. Sometimes he'll chain non-chord tones and have two in a row, which is exactly what we have here. We still, we don't, we don't need to do anything, come up with new names for anything. When we look at a non-chord tone, which is simply, as definition, a note that's not in the chord, we say, how is it prepared? In this case, it's by step. How is it resolved? By step in the same direction. That is the definition of a passing tone. For those of you that this might be, you're not quite sure what this is, you might want to save this video for later after you've gone through the lessons and gotten through non-chord tones. So this is assuming that you, you've gone through that and we're, we're trying to apply all our knowledge to analyze a Bach chorale. So don't feel bad. Pause this video, put it in uh, watch later, your watch later on YouTube, and go to the lessons. If you have to go back to lesson one and work your way forward, that's great. Do it. You've got this waiting for you when you're ready. So two passing tones in a row going to a five, six chord. All right. So let's keep going with our analysis. We then have E flat, B flat, G, C. Hmm. Well, at first blush, that looks like a C minor 7 chord with E flat in the bass. That's a little unusual, right? In the key of E flat, that would be a 6 7 chord. And we know that uh, in terms of 7th chords, 5 7 is fairly common. 2 7 and their inversions, right? 2 7 and 5 7, those are the common ones. Everything else is pretty uncommon, right? So 5-7, most common. 2-7, no, next most common. After that, we're getting unusual. So 6-7 immediately sends up like a little like warning signal in my analytical brain. So like I just said here, let's move forward. Let's see what happens next and see if that clarifies what's going on with, with this apparent C minor 7. Because it goes to, you know, C here, so E flat C, this is just an arpeggiation. Uh, the chord, the, the harmonic rhythm is not such that I'm, I'm thinking we're changing by eighth notes. So I'm just thinking that's just a revoicing of it. It's still, it's still a, a uh, that C minor 7. We then go to F, A natural, F, C. Don't forget that that C is c c carrying over. That's an F major triad. And that's not in the key of E flat. So, like I said, all of a sudden the C minor seven, ah, things, something's changing, right? Where the very next chord is not in the key. This might be a signal. But let's keep going because we see a fermata coming up. Fermata is a cadence, um, indicates a cadence, a point where things are slowing down. And you'll notice that rhythmically, right? The rhythms slow down. We go to quarter note, we got a half note, half note. Whereas we started kind of slow, then we have all these eighth notes in the middle that kind of propel us along, and then when we get to the cadence, the rhythms slow down. So let's, let's, let's finish it up. 
here we have B flat, D, F, B flat. Well, that's a B flat major triad. Which, you know, an F major triad, if we analyze this, like, so if we were to analyze this in the key of E flat, this would be a 6, 6, 5, which is, you know, warning, right? This is, that's unusual. I would, I would question that one. And then it goes to an F, which would be a 5, a 5, ending in 5. So you could analyze it that way, and you, but it's not, it's not really as illuminating in terms of describing what's really happening. This is really much more like a brief modulation to the key of the dominant. So this C, F, B flat would be like in the key of B flat, two, seven, five, one. And we did say five, seven, and two, seven were the most common. Here would be a great example of two, seven. So I would much rather I would much rather call this 26551 five, because that clarifies what the ear is really hearing. You're hearing is the, you're hearing by the time you get to by the time you get to you, this is when you get to this chord right here. Your ear has like a little question mark. It's like, "Oh, I wasn't expecting that." And by the time you get to here, you're like, "Wait a minute. I think we're going somewhere different because this relationship Two five is really solid in our, our psyches. And then when it goes to the one chord, it's like, oh, we're, we're, we've shifted. We've shifted to the dominant. Your ear subconsciously tells you that. And your, your, your body just goes, ah. Like it goes, question mark? Oh, I get it. It's kind of the emotional reaction. So since this is the first chord that's really unexpected, I like to back up one and see if I can call that a pivot chord. So if this is 5, 6 in the key of E flat, this would be 1, 6 in the key of B flat. And I like that as the, as, as the analysis, because then we can say, well, what does Bach do for his harmonic progression? 1, 5, 1, 5. Well, we know, I mean, you don't get any more basic than that, right? And then we go 1, 6, 2, 6, 5, 5, 1. Again, textbook, harmon good harmonic progression. Bach has done nothing unusual in terms of harmonic progression. He's done a temporary brief modulation. He's used some non-chord tones. He's used some, uh, some revoicing to cr create something interesting. So let me play it for you again uh, and just take a listen and see if that is enlightening now that you know what it is. Oh, I should have played that an octave too low, sorry. and we go and we're going to go to an E flat major triad coming up which is going to be right back to one so we can say we can say oh as soon as we get this A flat this A flat is telling us we've gone we're going back to E flat so it's kind of like we have a boom and then we shift that B flat major triad now becomes functioning like our five chord Alrighty, so I'm gonna erase this and rewrite, uh, and let, let, me, let me make sure you have, I'm sorry for erasing that quickly, but you can back up in the video. That's our first phrase. That's our first phrase, but let's move on. Let me write up for you the second phrase of this and see where it goes from there. And what's really interesting about something like this is how basic the chord progression is. At least, you know, and that's not always the case with Bach, but in this case, we he's able to make a simple one five one, two five one, and make it sound elegant, artistic, and beautiful. And part of that has to do with all those other aspects: the melody, the rhythm, the pacing, and really the use of non-chord tones. Uh, if you're looking to create a piece of music, if you can use those non-chord tones in as artful a way as Bach does, you will be in very, very good shape. 
and it can take something that's basically simple and give it that kind of elegance and sophistication. So let me put up for you the second phrase of this corral. And again, we are modulating right back to E flat very quickly. So it's a really a very brief temporary little modulation. So I'm just going to put that, that fourth beat up here. Okay, so it had the B flat and the soprano, um, and then the F and the alto, D in the tenor, B flat, and then we start the eighth note in the bass start up again, right? We're, we're, we're moving forward. That bass is propelling us forward. Uh, Melody-wise, we have F in the soprano, E flat, D, C, and this is a, the chorale melody, and we end on a B flat here, fermata again, with a rest afterwards. Our alto line, and you can kind of, um, let, me, let me put in the bass so you can kind of be analyzing as, as I'm putting in the extra voices, you can kind of guess between the soprano and the, uh, soprano and the bass what's going on. So here we go, G, a flat, these are eighth notes. Uh, and I'm going to make sure I'm in my right spot. G, F, E flat, and E flat. So these are eighth notes. Oh, no. Did I, made a, did I make a mistake already? No, I didn't. Okay. I did, I, did make a mis, I did make a mistake already. That is not the melody. So, let me try that again. All right. So let me, let me get my bass line finished so I don't lose my spot there. And this goes to D. C, B flat, A natural, B flat, F, bar line, B flat with fermata. Okay, so this is this is the full next phrase. Let me get you the correct melody. So goes to E flat, ding, dong. and let me make sure it's lining up here. So the B flat should line up here. And let me try to put these staff lines back in the way they should be. Someday I'm going to get a much bigger whiteboard, but this is a pretty small office, so I can have it all up for you all. But that is not today. Then F, E flat, D, C, B flat, Fermata. Okay. So those are my outer voices, and you should be able to get at least a, a sense of what the harmonic progression is with just that, because a lot of Theory exams will ask you to fill in the inner voices. The idea of a figure bass where they give you the bass and the melody with the numbers underneath is very common. But we do have it here, so I'm going to write it in for you. I'm going to start here with the, the tenor, which goes here to an E flat, E flat, B flat, doubles the E flat. No, I notice voice crossing right there, which is going to be a question. So you can certainly notice that there are some quote unquote part writing errors. And one must always ask the question, well, if Bach is breaking the rule, why, why is it? Is there, what, is there a real good reason and something we can learn from? And usually the answer is yes. It's, it's rare that you're going to be like, oh yeah, Bach made a mistake. Uh, that doesn't happen too often. Alrighty, and then finally putting in our alto voice so that we can 
we can analyze this. Uh, we have the F here. We have a B flat dotted quarter followed by an A flat, G, A flat to a B flat, and then B flat to C tied over, this is where it gets interesting, to a C, eighth note, then a B flat, then an A quarter, eighth note rather, A eighth note, to an F. There we go. That's what we got. So let's get to work. We, we recognize that we're back in the key of E flat. That is our five chord. Um, and that this A flat is a passing tone, so we will label it as such. And we know that we can put the lead sheet symbol above the B flat major triad. Then we have G, E flat, B flat, E flat. That is an E flat major triad with G in the bass, so a 1 6 chord. We then have an A flat um, right there. And that, again, is it, the harmonic rhythm is still the quarter note. That A flat is almost definitely a non chord tone. Prepared by up by step, resolved down by step in the opposite direction. That is textbook neighbor tone. So NT, we go back to the 1, 6 chord, so I don't need to change anything, it's, it kind of maintains. This F is a passing tone. This A flat is also a passing tone, but a passing tone in the alto now. So passing tone here. Then we get E flat, B flat, G, E flat. Again, that is an E flat major triad, this time in root position. So we can say root position one. Then we have again root position one. So when you say, oh, Dr. B, voice crossing here, how does Bach mitigate the issues with that? Well, he's, he's revoicing the chord. He's not going from one chord to another chord. And that makes it a little bit um, easier for the ears to just be like, oh, it's just a revoicing. Well, let's take a look at these non-chord tones here. We got passing tone, passing tone. Now, I, haven't, I didn't do that with the first phrase, but let's take a look at this uh, and, and look at what's the relationship. When, you have, when, I, when I first teach non-chord tones, I make the rule only one at a time because putting more than one at a time can get ugly fast. So in this case, where Bach has two passing tones happening at the same time, what is the relationship between these passing tones? Okay, so if we have, here we go. Well, the, the relationship between the two passing tones is a six. So we have parallel sixes, sound beautiful, very sweet, very pretty. We know that that's common. And so if we have here, and then at this, they've got this tension, right? Because that's your non chord tone tension, but then it resolves. And we have this super big octave leap in the bass, which gives it this kind of like brightness, a spring into it, uh, almost like it's like a slingshot or a launching pad. So he breaks that voice crossing rule right here where the bass goes higher than the, what the tenor used to be. So voice crossing, no, but how does he mitigate that? He, he mitigates it by keeping it within the same chord. Take a look here. Here we have two non-chord tones, the F and the A flat. That is a third. Parallel thirds and sixes tend to be very good and very effective. Um, you'll notice that if you, you back up and, and remember from the, the first phrase, well, no, there's nothing to remember there. Uh, we've, we've covered all of that. So let's just kind of listen to this part here and see where we're at so far. Sorry, 
sorry. Actually, it'll be pretty hard to look up and play the piano. So, anyways, you get a sense of that and what we're talking about. So, let's keep going with our analysis. This stays in one chord, so we don't need to do anything. Here we have D, F, B flat, F. So that is a B flat major triad with D in the bass, so we could call that 5, 6. This C looks suspiciously like another passing tone, and it is. We then get B flat, F, C, E flat. Well, that, that does not make a lot of sense, right? We're like, hmm. That doesn't spell a chord, right? Let's B flat, let's put it all in one octave, right? B flat, uh, C, E flat, F, right? That's not, that's not anything. Um, maybe, maybe this is another, this is probably another non-chord tone. That's the first thing we want to think about. So is there something that can change quickly or does change quickly that makes a difference? Well, this B flat does become an A natural. And if we take the A, the, replace that, we then have F, A, C, E flat, an F7. Well, that's, that's a chord we know about with A in the bass. And it's, it's very analogous to what we had before, where we had the two passing tones in the row. Uh, and one of them being an accented passing tone that then becomes the chord on the upbeat. So F7, um, well, that's, that's not... In our key, that's a chromatic chord. Uh, we, if we call, label it in, we would call it a five six five of five. And then we go to B flat F C D. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? That's not a a, a nice triad. We'll put it all in an order: C D F. Right? That's got too many notes for a triad and doesn't make a nice seventh chord. But let's see if something happens on the upbeat, just like we did before. Well, this C is tied over and moves to a B flat. Well, that's just a B flat major triad. That's, that's something we're very happy about. Uh, we can make a lot of sense of that. And that means that that C, prepared by common tone and resolved down by step, is the definition of a suspension. And keep in mind, Bach is using non-chord tones, and we've not encountered a single non-chord tone that isn't exactly textbook preparation and resolution. There's a, you know, this is kind of because Bach is the textbook, so it makes sense. Uh, but we could find some exceptions, right? Like we found this voice crossing, which is not textbook. So there are some exceptions. But we have our B-flat major triad here, and here we have F, F, B-flat, C. Well, that, that also poses some problems as it be not being a triad that we recognize, F, F, B flat, C. So let's move forward, look at the upbeat, and at the upbeat we have F, C, A, C. Well, that's just an F major triad. The doubling's a little unusual, the two Cs, but it is an F major triad. So does this B flat look like a non-chord tone that we can identify? Yes. It is prepared by common tone, resolved down by step. So it is just another suspension. So then we have a suspension right here as well. The B-flat becomes a suspension um, on beat four. So if we were to indicate, again, in the key of E-flat, and I'm not saying this is correct, so bear with me, right? We call that five. We call that five of five. We then go to a B-flat major triad, five. All right, so this is how you would analyze it in the key of E flat major. But as we remember from the last phrase, we kind of modulated to the dominant. And it looks to me like we're doing the same thing here. All this five of five, five, five of five, five. It's a lot. So I would prefer, since this is the first chord that's not in the key, is to go back, call this my pivot chord. So call this a one six in the key of B flat. And then we can simply take out, just make these uh, a five, six, five, one, five, one. 
which is a bit more how our ears are going to hear it. Uh, it, it, it does be, you can argue, you know, is it, is it brief enough that you can consider it just secondary functions as opposed to a modulation? Because that's what we're talking about. Are, is it better, is it more accurate, is it more descriptive of how we hear it to call them secondary dominants or to call it a modulation? And I'm going to argue for modulation and I'm going to give you my reasons. Because it has a strong cadence in what would be the modulation. If this was internal and by the time we got to the cadence, it, we were back in E flat, I would call that those secondary dominants. But we actually have a strong cadence in that. Now, you could say, well, Dr. B, what, it's a, it could be a half cadence. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And this is where music theory arguments can happen. You know, how do you hear it? Do you really hear it as just being uh, a, a half cadence? Do you hear it as a half cadence? In which case, you shouldn't modulate, and you would call them secondary dominance. Or do you hear it as uh, a, a, a temporary modulation and sound more like a perfect authentic cadence, but in the key of the dominant? And so I'm, in the description of this video, I'm going to put a link to this Bach chorale. And that's really a question you have to answer for yourself. You have to listen and say, well, what does it sound like to me? To me, it sounds more like this. And I think I have some good reasons on why, why, it could, why it should be that way. But it's definitely open to discussion. Uh, it's not, this is not a thing where I'd be like, you're just absolutely wrong if you call it the other way. I could see arguments. Because it isn't that long that we've modulated. And we're, in the last case, we went back right away. So uh, what I would like to do now is kind of open this up for, for questions. Uh, we could keep going with the whole Bach chorale. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not that long, but it does take a bit of time. But I'm hoping that this uh, kind of putting your practical skills to, to the test has proven useful in terms of how I'm talking out loud, like what my thought process is. So I'm trying to go through my mind and try to give you the questions you should ask yourself as you're doing an analysis of a piece. Very often, if you know the right question to ask, you're going to end up with the right answer, especially if you've gone through all my lessons, you have the knowledge. Sometimes where you get stuck is you're not quite sure what the question is. You're like, I don't know what this is. What, what, what should I ask myself to get to the right answer? And so this should be somewhat useful and hopefully it was helpful. So I'm going to go to the chat now and see uh, if we got some questions. I did have one other person to, that was asking questions about non-diatonic chord substitutions and I am going to talk about that. Uh, so, so do not fear. Uh, we got some love from India. Thank you very much. Love it. Uh, got some people who have benefited. Ah, oh, someone's wishing me happy birthday. Yeah, I was on Monday. Thank you very much. I had a lot of fun. Um, for grime theory, that might be a, uh, that might be a, someone's asking, hey, professor, can you do a series for grime theory? I don't know what grime theory is. That might be a typo, but I really think there should be grime theory, and I would like to know what it is. It sounds awesome. Uh, an electronic music sheet theory. Uh, so electronic music. So I. So one of the here's the here's a thing, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try to make sure thing everything is clear for everyone. Sometimes knowing how to phrase your question is like so important. So electronic music sheet theory is a strange way to phrase the question. So is that asking about electronic music? What's the theory behind, behind that? Sheet, when people talk about sheet music, they're really just talking about, they're talking about, you know, sheet music, right? This is sheet music. It's the notation, right, of, of music, so sheet music. So the, you would not normally phrase your question in this way. Um, electronic music is such a wide genre. So originally it's starting out in like the universities like Columbia universities that have these giant rooms that like the entire computer takes the entire room and it tends to be uh, what's considered kind of avant-garde very dissonant very 
uh, atonal or noise based as opposed to pitch based but we also have like electronic music in a more popular dance club genre so uh, I did a video where I analyzed a piece that was a little bit in that s style uh, I think it was by Kashmir I can't, I can't remember it was a little bit ago so take a look and see if I can maybe direct you to that to that link see if that might help you out so take a look at that. All right. All right. Blue Misses is here. Yeah, I'm trying to make these, these live Q&As regular. I'm trying to do them every other week on Saturdays. And one of, the, one of the things is one of my people who supports me on Patreon. So he sent me an email, and he's been taking the, the placement and, and exams for the Royal Academy of Music in London. And he passed his level three exam. Uh, and I, I answered one of those questions on one of these live Q&As, a couple, you know, a, a little bit. And it was like a step-by-step. -step, here's how you complete, you know, here's how you complete composing a melody. Some of you may go back and remember that video. Anyways, he passed. And that was one of the categories he got the highest grade in, was the one where I gave him the step-by-step -step process. So he was able to use it. And he was able to pass that level three music theory um, exam for, for the Royal Academy of Music in London for that, that branch school. So anyways, he wants to then go and do level 8. So I, don't ask me why there's no level 7. We're going straight to level 8. But what I'm going to do is he's going to, he sent me three questions that are going to be on the level 8 exam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of do a step-by-step -step process for each one of those questions. So in two weeks, I'm going to start off with answering one of his questions to help him prepare because he's got one year to get ready for this next exam. So this is, again, long-term thinking. You know, you want to master music theory, you got to put in the time, and it's over a, a consistent... It's like exercising. You don't, you don't cram for a marathon. You don't cram to, like, be a, a weightlifter. You, you do it consistently every day. Uh, and so we're starting now, and, he, and uh, you know, he's, he's a supporter of mine on Patreon, and we're going to work together through these videos, and you all are going to benefit from kind of seeing how some of these questions, the kinds of questions that are asked, and the step-by-step -step processes that can be developed to really help answer that. So yeah, I'm going to be doing this hopefully every two weeks, and you'll be able to ask questions after I talk about whatever I started with. All right. Can you do more four-part harmony chords, seventh chords, and extended chords? You know, that's, that's a yes, I can do more with that. And, and we did, I do have a couple videos that are up, and I'm going to erase this here so I can start talking about that. Talking about ninth chords, eleventh chords, add six chords, things like that. Um, and I think I could do more with that. So let me just give you a preview, but I, I would like to kind of do a more in-depth preparation of that. But let me get something up quick for you. So this is four-part harmony using, let's say, let's say some ninth chords. And the trick is, first just knowing how to spell it, then knowing if you're going to do four-part writing, what notes you're going to leave out, right? Because if you're talking about a ninth chord, that's technically five different notes, so you got to leave something out. And all the rules. Now, what's nice about these upper structure harmonies is that they function the same as our triads that we, we know and love. So if we're doing a five chord with a nine, with a ninth in it, it's going to function the same way as our five chord does. And same with, uh, let's say, if we did a, a 2 9, right? It's going to function the same. So let's say, let's put ourselves in C major because it's going to be easy to think of. The chord, a, a five, 5 chord, would be G, B, D, F, A. And our 2 9, which I should probably have gone in front because that's the way harmonic progressions would go, would be D, F, A, C, E. But if we're going to do four-part writing, we know we can't have all five notes. So what's the note you leave out? It's the same note you leave out in all our other stuff. If it's a, if it's a perfect fifth, if it has a perfect fifth, that's the most redundant note. So 
you would leave out the D here, and you would leave out the A here. The fifth is such a consonant interval that it's implied. So you can take it out, and you, and you can still have, have that chord. So we're in the key of C major. Our chord might be, but uh, will be the same, s similar enough that we will get it. And same if we're going for our. The fifth is so implied, so consonant, that we really don't, it, it can, we don't need it. So let's take a progression. Let's go one. Let's try to keep it, get it a little interesting. Let's go one, four, two with the nine, um, five with the nine, back to one, all right? So we're gonna go C, F, D, let's put the G down here, back to C. So that'll be our baseline. Let's think about a uh, a soprano line that we're gonna we're gonna enjoy. So let's give it, we're gonna move up. So let's have our voicing be. Let's have that be our first voicing. So we give us some a nice open voicing to give us room. So we'll start with that. And if we do that, uh, I, I'm probably gonna want to move this up here. I'm gonna keep a common tone. That'll be my four chord. And then here, the seventh of a, a chord is always prepared. You have to be careful of its preparation, so I can prepare that by common tone. Now, here, this A could be a common tone, but that's the note we want to leave out in the two, not, to the two, two ninth chord. The nine also has to be above the third. So, you, would know, you might say, oh, look, we're just going to maintain the F as the third. It's not going to work, because that means and then the 9 is down here. So if you, like, either it's like, uh, so it wouldn't work, right? So if you did it, F here and E here, it's going to create a minor second, and you're going to have a huge spacing error. So that doesn't work. Uh, if you put the E down here, you have a spacing error here, and it's the most dissonant interval in the world. A minor nine, uh, a minor nine. So it's just going to be like it's going to be too. That's just too dissonant. You got the spacing error and that that exacerbated minor ninth interval. So listen, to what it would sound like. It's so dissonant, right? Sometimes I forget I should actually play for you all the things that don't work. So you can compare and contrast and hear like, oh, that's why you don't do that. So what you do is you have to put the nine on top. It has to be higher than the third. There's, there's one exception in terms of voicings on how you do that. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, but in this case, it makes a lot of sense to have the F and that there. The F in the alto and the E. That way we don't have a spacing error. And then the major seven is not as dissonant an interval as the minor nine. So let's hear what that sounds like, and then I'll tell you the, ex the exception. Okay, so then we're going from... Actually, that doesn't sound very good to me. Something might be wrong here, because we're going from... Maybe I've just played it wrong. Let me try it again. I just haven't resolved it yet, right? But this is going to be tricky. This is actually a hard one because because I, I it wants to resolve to the. So we might not be able to really to go right from the two nine to the five nine because this is going to need to resolve. Uh, we're not going to be able to necessarily pull that off. Because this is, this is pretty dissonant, right? Um, we got that smooth motion there, but we really want this to go to a D here. So you would want it to resolve like so to the 5 chord. And you could make it a 5-7, is no problem. But 
but to, to, to lose the D and go to an A, just the voice leading would not work well. So let's finish up writing this one. Like so. So we start off like this, so. I'm going to put the G up an octave just so that I can play the whole chord with my hands because I don't have a reach. It's quite that big, but that actually, that actually works pretty well. Let's listen to it again. Right? That's a very colorful two, nine, two chord, a ninth chord, right? That's got that really shimmery, uh, bright, like surprising feel. But the voice leading is really good for, for, for the whole thing. So it, everything is, so it, it's prepared, it's resolved. We go. So in this case, you know, it's just not a really good way to, to go from the 2-9 to the 5-9 in this situation. Uh, I'd have to work on figuring out how you would do that. Maybe you'd need to be using inversion so that the voice leading could also make it work. So a couple things to keep in mind. The 9th and any upper structure, 11th, 13th, needs to be exactly that. It's, it's called an upper structure. So it needs to be at the top part of the chord. You want your 3rd and the 7th. Okay, so here's your third of the chord, here's your seventh of the chord. You want these to be the meat and then have the upper structures on top, okay? Now, there, there is an exception where sometimes you'll put the ninth and the third a half step apart. So you might do something like... Uh, like that, right? We still omit, this is still our, our two, two chord with the ninth in there. We get something like this. That happens. Notice it's not the, the E here and the F on top, the minor ninth I was talking about. That you don't find. It most commonly have the F here and up a major seven with the, the ninth on top, but sometimes you put it right together, a half step apart, and it creates this kind of shimmer, this, this dissonant shimmer when we go. And this is like, you know, it, it, sometimes like, um, this kind of like in a minor, Kind of get that that gives it that 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 edge that's kind of emotional edge. Something's not quite there, but it's like, it's like a painful beauty. So, anyways, I hope that gives you just a little bit there, talking about four part harmony and seventh chords with extended chords. So you got a, a taste. All right, passing tone, passing tone, passing tone. We're all in agreement. All righty. All right, all right. Oh, I see that there are some students here that have actually been in the class with me in person and live. So uh, awesome to see you all. Hope you're having a good summer. Hope you're keep, keeping a lot of music going on in your life. But I'm glad that you're uh, getting some more Dr. B music theory. All right, so Danny's asking about chromatic chord subs besides the tritone sub. I know secondary dominant leading tone chords, the, th the three augmented six chords, and the Neapolitan fall in the category of chromatic chord subs too. You're absolutely right, Danny. And an interesting kind of clarification on, on what you were saying there. So the Neapolitan and the tritone sub have some, some similarities and some overlap. So if you know your Neapolitan chords. It's a flat two chord, 
usually found in first inversion. But if we say, well, tritone sub of 5 is actually a flat 2. So we actually have some similarities in that. But let's talk, and I'm just going to put up those, those options that we have put on the board, or that you listed rather in your question. I'm going to put them up on the board. So chromatic chords. So this is to make sure we, we're keeping clear. Differentiating between modulation, where we change key, and where we're in a key, but there's a chord that's not in the key, but you still feel and hear as if you are in that key, right? So that's a tricky balance, right? Like too much chromaticism, your ear won't feel like you're in the key anymore. It'll be like, we're somewhere else. So the idea of chromatic chords that are not in the key, but still sound like you're in the key. And that's a very tricky balance. Uh, so we talked, so Danny mentioned secondary functions, right? So secondary, dominant, and leading tone. Now, from our discussion about the Bach chorale at the beginning of this Q&A, we talked about how secondary dominance, it, you know, it's sometimes tricky to decide, have you modulated or is it a secondary dominant? Is it, does it still sound like you're in your key, but with a chromatic chord? Or does it sound like you've modulated? And that has a lot to do with how long you're there, whether there's a big cadence coming up that, that confirms or denies one of those options. But certainly that's a big category of, of things that can be used. Uh, Neapolitan six chord, uh, augmented six chords, Uh, and I'm trying to think what else we had in the tritone sub. Um, and here, just some of the things to keep in mind is that, especially with chords like the augmented six chords, these are often almost, I, to a certain extent, you can consider them voice leading chords. They really help you move from one chord to another chord within a specific key, even though that transitional chord, that voice leading chord, isn't there, right? So if we think about like things like like a jazz progression, and in this case I was playing C to C sharp diminished seven, to D minor seven, to D sharp diminished seven, to E minor seven, right? If we look at that progression, the C sharp and the D sharp are not in the key. They are secondary leading tone chords, but they also just kind of help us get from They kind of help us just get from here to D, from the C to the D minor seven to the to the E minor seven. So instead of just going, I could just you know. I could just go up and down the diatonic chords, right? But I can get there in a in a little bit more. A little, with a little bit more excitement, a little bit more tension by putting in these voice leading chords that kind of get me, get me there. So they often are ways, you'll notice that like smooth voice leading is so critical with all these types of chords and one of the things we talk about. Um, Again, going back to that Bach chorale, because we can learn so much by studying these Bach chorales. The one time he breaks the, the voice crossing rule, it's within the singular chord, right? It's within, which is the, within the tonic chord, the most stable chord ever in your key, right? And it's no chord change. He's not going to do that kind of break a rule when it's like so critical that voice leading is important because 
there's an, an inherent instability here. And so doing anything crazy like throwing voice crossing out the, out the, you know, out the door would not work. So Danny's asking about, well, what other options are there? Well, certainly you remember that you have your mode mixture chords. And we've, we've talked about that in the lessons, right? So mode mixture is, is technically chromatic, but it keeps you in the, in the key. So I'll give a, a quick, a quick uh, example of what we're talking about there. So here, if let's say we're in the key of C major, we might go one, uh, let's say, let's go one, six, and let's go to minor four, five, one. Let's try that, right? So. Right? So that's a really exciting way. And, and, and so what is it that we're doing in this, in this situation, right? The four chord, and this is a review. You can look at the, the video on it, on it and on because I get it's one of the lessons, right? But right here, that's your chromatic chord. The root is so defining, and the harmonic progression is so much based on the root that the progression by mixing the mode, so basically saying, I'm going to temporarily pretend that this four chord is from a minor key, even though I'm really in the key of C major. One, six, four, five, one is such a strong harmonic progression that if I just change the sonority, right, normally it would be a major chord. Normally it would be a, a major four chord. But changing the one note, right, the one note, it's only one note difference, it doesn't change the way it functions. It just gives it this, this color, this difference. Let me, play, let me play you the two options, right? So we got one, let's do it with the regular, regular four chord. Let's do it the other way. All right? How does it how does it feel different? Because it feels different. But the progression, that bass line drives it, but it does feel different, right? And it's only one note difference. It's a temporarily going into the minor key. So don't forget mode mixtures as, a, as another option for for chord sub chromatic chord substitutions. Now, there aren't a ton other chord substitutions beyond these. There really aren't, because there's just so far you can go before you, you don't sound like you're in the key. Some of the things I've mentioned before um, is different sonorities. So uh, getting into uh, add two chords, ninth chords. Um, they can be chromatic and kind of have certain secondary or circle of fifths functions. You can do that. Um, another thing you can do, so there's a couple other things that are, are not on this list that get into a certain level of complexity that I'm only going to introduce you to. I'm not going to, to go into to great detail. Um, but I want you to be aware of them, and, and maybe at some point I can go. Chordal harmony is one of them. Um, polytonality or polychords is another. Um, and then there's kind of a, I mean, how am I going to, what, what category would I put? It's like chord substitutions patterns. So, Institution patterns. All right, so these are like the three big areas I want to just talk about a little bit here. Um, so chordal harmony, this is kind of like Debussy, where you start getting things like, that's your chord. It's a three note chord. But it is not a triad, because the definition of a triad is three note, chord, stacked in thirds. 
meaning the interval of a third. So C, E, G. C, E is a third. E, G is a third. And that's all called part of tertial harmony. And you can go up, right? 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. After you've done that, you loop her back around. So just check, check it out, right? So if we go 1, 3, 5, uh, sorry, 7, 9, 11, 13, we go up again, we get to a C. We're back to our, our 1, right? So with tertial harmonies, we can go up to 13th chords. Now sometimes you have people like uh, Aaron Copeland using like kind of these more every note in the scale kind of chords. Because if you think about it, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. We've got every note in the scale when we do that. And usually it would be... And you might move, you often have parallels. So, like some of his music from uh, Our Town has these feelings, and it might not use all of the chords, but it'll, it'll use a lot of them. Sometimes it was called pan diatonicism. Pan meaning all, diatonicism, diatonic meaning notes within the sim singular scale. Uh, he might, Aaron Copeland would sometimes just not do it so basically, but he might have some. Some other like voicings, like where it'll be more spread out. So you have this tertial harmony stacked in thirds. We also have chordal harmony stacked in fourths. Now, chordal harmony, you can you can, you know you can keep going just like you stack keep stacking. You can go up and stack on top of that F, and then put a B, so, so every now and then you might have an augmented fourth instead of a perfect fourth as part of it. So you get stuff like... And again, parallelism is really popular when you're using that. And you'll hear this in some of, some of the Russian music in the end of the 19th century, uh, French music. Uh, you'll hear it in, in the jazz of uh, John Coltrane uh, in the 1960s where you'll have... So it's all just like chordal harmonies going up and down by step. And every now and then, you sit, but you're kind of keeping it within the diatonic scale. So it's within that key. You're using this kind of modal scale concept. And you're just planing, just moving all in parallel motion. So chordal harmonies is certainly one thing. Uh, polytonality and polychords. Think uh, French composers like Darius Mio. So you'll have, um, for, for this, you'll have things where you might have something like, uh, let's say, F, F major triad over A major triad. So F over A. But we're talking about a whole triad. We're not talking about an F major triad with A in the bass. We're talking about full triads. And so you have these, these polytonal things and you'll have, you'll have like one melody. And another. So it's kind of like chromatic, but you're not in any one key. You're actually in multiple keys at the same time. And what happens is like each one of them kind of like makes sense as a key on its own, but they're juxtaposed. 
And so a lot of composers played with this. Darius Mio, uh, American composer Charles Ives. And Charles Ives kind of grew up in uh, Connecticut. And there was lots of marching bands and parades all the time because he's kind of an early 20th century composer. And so he would talk about, as a kid, sitting on his porch and a band comes from one direction down the street playing a song in, let's say, A major. And another band comes down the other way, because there's so many parades that are so popular, playing in the key of F major. And at a certain point, they go by each other. And you can hear both of them. And each one of them makes sense. But they're juxtaposed on top of each other. And so that juxtaposition as a concept of polytonality is something that can be explored. And so uh, one of the things I printed out to answer Danny's question was, so there's some jazz versions of that too. So there's this piece, a composer, a uh, pianist named Richie Byrack. And he did this thing called Night Lake. And you'll look and you'll see that like in the third chord, you have this A flat with E in the bass. Now here he's not talking about two different polychord triads, but it's an implication of that. Let me tell you why, right? So this is what he has. Because E is not in an A flat major triad. So what so what this is the first one is F F triad in the top, A triad in the bottom. So there's that option. Then there's A flat, I'm sorry, F major triad in the top, A major triad in the bottom. Here in this case with this jazz one, I'm talking about A flat major triad in the top with an E bass note. So you have to be careful like how these are written. The, the, the way that it's notated varies from, from place to place. So here, you're getting this chord. Now, how do you get into that? Because all by itself, you're like, that doesn't sound pretty. That's kind of ugly. Uh, you get the beauty of the major triad, but this note creates some, some dissonances with that. Well, oh, maybe you don't think it's ugly. Let's take a look at what you actually get, all right? Because it does work, uh, especially if you use it in the right context. So E to A flat is enharmonically a major third. E to C would be, let's call it for right now, an augmented fifth. Bear with me, right? So if we're going E, A flat, we're going to use some enharmonic spellings here. Uh, let me do a better job at writing this clearly for you all. Let's call that a major seven. So you could call this a, uh, also call this an E major seven sharp five. Call it tertial, right? Up a major third, up another major third, up a minor third. I'll move to so you can see that. So in this case, he has this kind of D flat minor. Uh, uh, so he has D flat minor. Uh, let me voice that a little bit higher for you. go, here's that chord. So this is the kind of progression that he's using. He's using two, two, Here's where you get the real resolution. So that's another example of this kind of like polytonality, polychord. Uh, and a lot of early 20th century, especially French composers, are playing around with this. And if you look at, if you kind of say, like, what are the, all the permutations, right? So if you take a C major triad, say it's C trait, that's going to be what I'm doing. What can I put in my bass? You're like, what are all the options and what they sound like? Well, if I put C in the bass, 
it's a C major triad. If I put B in the, B in the bass, it's like a C major seven with B in the bass. If I put B flat, it's like a C seven with B flat, right? That's common. That actually sounds like a, sounds more like an A minor seven chord, right? Now here's where we get that that C with A flat in the bass. It sounds like a um, a major uh, major seven sharp five. So it also sounds like C, but with the uh, it sounds like an A flat major seven sharp five, and then you have a C with G in the bass. That sounds like a suspension. It sounds like we're gonna go. Sounds like a one six four, right? And if we put C with F sharp in the bass, that is definitely doesn't sound like anything we've done before, right? That's definitely in there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put brackets around the ones that are definitely not part of the harmonic language that we're, we're we've we've covered in general. Then if we put C F rather. F in the bass. Uh, that's a, that sounds kind of like a like a, a ninth chord. Uh, it definitely sounds diatonic. With E in the bass, it's just a first inversion triad. Now that that that's another one, right? C major triad with E flat in the bass. That's going to be one of our more dissonant. Definitely not diatonic. And then D in the bass sounds like it'd be diatonic. With D flat in the bass, that is definitely one of our more chromatic options. So that's just an example of taking a major triad. You could do it with a minor triad. Uh, that doesn't have to be the only sonority. Major happens to be the most common because when you're you're dealing with this level of dissonance with the ones I put into the red boxes. The major triad is kind of something that the ear can latch onto as being like, oh, that makes sense. And then the note that's non-diatonic, that's in the bass, as a singular bass note like this, um, gives it this, this kind of sometimes creepy feeling um, or sometimes spooky, eerie mysterious, magical, those are some of the adjectives I would use to describe all of those. But that's another way where you can be like, I'm in a key, but I'm substituting these chords that are just coming from a whole other language, which is more of a polychord, polytonality. And then lastly, chord substitution patterns, kind of like the idea of a sequence, which, which we've talked about a little bit. Uh, I haven't spent a ton of time talking about them, but there's so many options in terms of sequences. Um, as, as, a, as a person who loves both my classical music and my, and my jazz music, I can't help but mention Coltrane changes. I probably have mentioned them before. So John Coltrane is a jazz saxophonist. And Coltrane changes. And if I give you a, a quick example, you can see that it's a pattern. And the pattern allows you to kind of like be in a key and then you're either, you're like you kind of stay in that key, though you can also argue you're temporarily shifting. But B major seven, up a minor third to D seven, down a perfect fifth to G major seven, up a minor third, and it's, that's the up, up a minor third is like the main, main feature, right? Down a perfect fifth is the second part, which is pretty traditional. Then you have a little break because it's every two beats. And then a 2 5 1 to the next part of the, of the pattern. Uh, so the next part of the pattern would be starting on a G major 7. Right? So if we take a look at that, we get. Let me say again. Right, so we have 
That's your, that's your basic pattern, right? And it's that sequence. We go up a minor third, then down a fifth, down a perfect fifth, up a minor third, down a perfect fifth. So that's the, the essence. And so how this would be applied uh, is, is if you're, let's say, in the key of E flat, Instead of what you might normally have, which would be like a, let's say, F minor 7, B flat 7, E flat major 7, you might do this. You might put, do these Coltrane changes, because you end up getting where you want to at the appropriate resolution time, but you have all this chromatic tension. So, so you have all these, so this is tension. Tension, oh, here, look, it lines up right here. Right here, we get the line up, resolution. So increase tension to our expected resolution. And that's, that's a common way that these kind of chord substitutions, especially non-diatonic chord substitutions, they increase the tension to thereby have a greater impact on resolution. And that's kind of a fundamental concept between any of this kind of tension resolution. So, it's easy sometimes for composers when you start messing around with chord substitutions to overdo it or to use it in places where you never get to the point of resolution that you're expecting. And then it just sounds ugly and dissonant and like a bunch of wrong notes. But if you increase the tension at the right points and then resolve them at the right points, it can be, it can be really effective emotionally. So Danny, I hope that gives you some things to talk about. Each one of these things could just be, we could talk about polychords for, for hours, and we could talk about chord substitution patterns for hours and chordal harmony, um, but it at least gives you some, some things to work with. All righty. Uh, we got another question. In common practice period, that means Mozart, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, traditional classical, uh, do the composer write lyrics for the vocal composition or, or he or she don't and lyrics is being taken from somewhere else and someone else wrote them? Yeah, that's actually the, so who writes the lyrics is the question. Um, in general, the, they're getting it from someone else. So Mozart, so like in the case of the Bach chorale, those were, those were probably written, the lyrics were probably written by Martin Luther. The guy, not, not, not Martin Luther King, we're talking about Martin Luther who nails the 95 Thesis on the church door at Wittenberg Cathedral saying that he's got some problems with the Catholic Church, and here's 95 of them. Um, but he then he did, actually was, a, in addition to being a, theo, a theologian, he also was a composer, and he wrote new music for the Lutheran Church that was in German, the language that the German people could understand, which because they couldn't understand Latin, which was the Catholic Church services. Um, and so when Bach takes some of these things, he's taking lyrics of Luther, or he's setting the passages from the Bible. It's already been written. He's just then putting the melody and harmony to it. And this is the same thing for, for Mozart. With Mozart, uh, his operas are usually based on novels, stories, and his librettist, And the librettist is someone who writes what's called a libretto. So think of a libretto like a screenplay for like a film. Like if you're going to do uh, a Harry Potter film, you're not, you're, setting, you're not going to have all the actors say everything that's in the book. It would be just too long. You have a screenplay, which is like a condensed version. That's what a libretto is, but for operas. And a librettist is the person who writes the libra libretto. And so Lorenzo de Ponte was was Mozart's primary librettist. And so he would get the words, and Mozart then would put them, put the music to them. A big change happens. That's, this is not always the way it works, but this was the way it was normal for the common practice period. By the time you get to Richard Wagner, though, what's one of the things that he does um, that's kind of revolutionary? So Wagner is enough of a good writer that Wagner is writing, you know, the story, the libretto, and 
all the music, right? So when you're talking about um, Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, Tristan and Isolde, he's, he's taking inspiration from often Norse mythology in some of those stories. So it's not 100%, it's definitely not 100% original. But he's writing the libretto. He's actually choosing the words that, that, that are going to be set to music. So I hope that answers that question. Good, good one, though. Good one. A hello from Italy uh, about minimalism. How can, it not, how can it be not boring despite how repetitive and simple it is? Excellent question. Uh, excellent question. So we're talking about minimalism. All right. So... In the case of minimalism, and minimalism is a style of music that kind of comes late 60s, I guess, uh, in the 70s and 80s. It's kind of 1970s, 1980s. Uh, I'm running out of ink on this one, too. I'm going to need some new pens. So minimalism. So minimalism, its characteristics are that it is very repetitive. Uh, it is often diatonic and tonal. Um, but tonal only in the broader sense of the word, not like traditional like progression, progression. It, it's, it's, it unfolds much slower. So like harmonic rhythm is like crazy slow. Like harmonic rhythm is like eight measures or... 16 measures or whatever you want to say uh, slower moving this is particularly in terms of things like harmonic harmonic rhythm so composers you want to listen to to, to hear Steve Reich um, Philip Glass there's there are others um, I actually mentioned in one of my earlier videos, I went to a, a performance of some of Steve Reich's music where he was in attendance and then had a, had a discussion and talked afterwards. And I found it really interesting um, what he was saying. He was saying that when he was growing up, going to school and learning all about music and how to be a composer, everyone and everything being taught was in a kind of atonal, 12-tone, uh, method as, as kind of founded by Arnold Schoenberg with, with very little emphasis on melody. And Steve Reich was saying he, like, he really wanted to write melodies again. He wanted to write melodies. But you couldn't just write melodies like you did back in the 19th century and do something new. Like you, to be original, you had to come up with a new way of writing melodies. And so what he did is he kind of came up with this slower minimalism background on which to write these longer unfolding melodies. And I would argue that early on there's a, there was a bit of experimentation on how to do this. And some of those experiments were more successful than others. This is where I'm willing to like put my, my reputation out, uh, out there and my, my willingness to critique others. Uh, so Steve Reich has, had a piece called Violin Phase which I think is terrible. I think it's like Chinese water torture. It's so repetitive that it's kind of like that, the concept of like a drop of water, drop of water, drop of water, drop of water. No new sensory in, in, you know, information. After a certain part, your brain is still processing the drip of water. It wants to process something else. It's not given anything else. It still must keep processing it, and eventually you go insane. That's the concept behind Chinese water torture. And violin phase has a ba 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 and it loops it. It records it on a electronic tape. Then you have a live performer who plays along with it, and then just kind of like speeds up or or slows down and goes out of phase. So like it gets a little bit out of sync, and this unfolds over so such a long period of time. And it's so repetitive, and it just goes out of sync. That's the only thing that happens. It's like how much out of sync this violin melody is. It's a diatonic melody. It's very repetitive. It slowly goes out of sync. It doesn't work for me emotionally at all in any way. Uh, 
That said, there's other pieces he's written that I'm like, wow, that really does work. It feels like, like it almost gives it a meditative quality where you're sitting there and you just see things like, for other ones feel like lying on a field watching some clouds kind of like turn into different shapes slowly over a, a long period of time. So to, to go back to the question, um, how can it not be boring despite how repetitive and simple it is? Well, it's, it's a matter of the balance between enough repetition, which it's going to have enough of, that's not the problem, and enough variety, right? So this, is, this question is the eternal question of composers and the concept of form, right? The concept of form. The concept of form is how do you have a structure that maintains the interest of the listener so that they don't become bored and just wander off and be like, I'm out of here, I'm done, right? So how do you do it, right? So you need to have, you need to have enough repetition so that they don't get lost. If there is zero repetition, and it's like new melody, new melody, new melody, new thing, new melody, new melody, new melody, new melody. At a certain point, you're like overload, overload, too much information, right? So zero repetition. Like if we, we say like like if it was zero percent repetition and a hundred percent variety, it it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Um, and I would say that sometimes some of the some some twentieth century more dissonant atonal music. Um, serial music sometimes experiments with things getting very, very close to 0% repetition. Uh, and even if they say, well, there's repetition, um, the question is not repetition that you can point to in a score, but repetition that the audience can actually pick up on, right? So you can't just say, oh, look, I repeated this, this, this 48 note pattern. So every 48 notes, I repeat it. Like, that's too much. No one, no one can really pick up on that. Even at a subconscious level, they're not picking up on that. So when we talk about repetition, again, let me say it again, repetition that an audience at some level, even if it's subconscious, can pick up on. So that's zero repetition, repetition with 100% variety. Now, minimalism, if it, minimalism gets really close to, to almost doing the opposite, right? Where it's 100% repetition, or really close, right? Not 100%, but let's say 98% repetition and 2% variety. There's, there's, like, there's a level where it's like, you got to get that balance right. Um, I would argue that like the Steve Reich violin phase would probably be like, I would probably put it like this, 98% repetition, 2% variety. The going out of phase, that's the variety, right? But some of the more successful stuff, like so Steve, Steve Reich has one called Trillium. That's, that's more like 70%, mm, 30% is what I would guess. And I'm just, I haven't given that a ton of thought, so please don't hold me to that. But there, it's like, it's a lot of repetition, but there's enough variety. And in in, in so, so to answer that, the question is, it's getting the right balance of repetition and variety, and I would say then the, then the right kind of variety at the right points in time. There's, there's limits, right? And this is, this, is similar, this is similar to the noise and pitch issue uh, that I talked about in one of my earlier videos. So if you want to interested in that, I'm talking about um, pitch versus noise. So sound is the big category, and what, what percentage of that sound is noise and what is pitch? And if you're dealing with like distortion on a guitar, like how does that affect the perception? So there's this continuum. And there's a certain point where, you know, it's so much distortion, there is no pitch, right? Or it's all pitch with zero, it's like a sine wave. And the question is like, where is that cutoff? And there is, I mean, it's not like arbitrary. There is a point where it is. Um, so I was going to talk about consonance and dissonance. That was the other one. because this plays in as well to this idea of minimalism and repetition. So consonance is, is there's a, 
the objective criteria on what is consonant and what is not, right? So, fifths and octaves. Consonant. In every culture throughout human history. Sorry, I played a wrong note. Now just imagine. I'm changing the rhythm, so I'm having some variety. But everything is consonant. It sounds a little bit like, you know, you're in a planetarium or something and they're... My question is, how long can you listen to this consonants before you get bored? It's pretty. But, you know, a Beethoven symphony can last half an hour easy. Could you listen to that for a half an hour? Or would you need at some point some dissonance to keep things unexpected, some variety? Right, so here it is. There's my dissonance. And then I resolve it back to my consonants. What's the ratio between consonants and dissonance? And if it's 100% consonant, the chances are your audience will get bored fairly quickly. Because it's like, oh, you're like, oh, that's pretty. It's nice. I like it. That's it? What else? No, no drama, no, no tension, no... It's just all just there. Um, you know, if you're, if you're getting, you know, if you're... You're doing like yoga or meditating or, or you know, you're thinking about like kind of a healing center. You might have something that's like really strong on the like high percentage consonants. The idea is it's just kind of lulling you into this kind of other place. But that's often as, a, as an accompaniment to another activity, not the activity itself. On the other hand, if you have 100% dissonance, your audience is just like, oh, they're just going to get annoyed and then get bored, right? So it's, it's the balance between consonants and dissonance that is where the most interesting music often occurs. Same is true with the, the, the balance and the interplay between repetition and variety. So sonata form, like Haydn and Mozart, is like an experimentation with the balance between repetition and variety in how form. And minimalism has that same thing. They're just getting, they're just playing with that relationship with a lot more emphasis on the repetition. How can they do it? Well, you get enough things that are different. Like, sometimes you'll have a little bit more distance. So you might have a lot of repetition in a... Uh, so, like, think of... Uh, if you listen to Steve Reich's Trillium, the repetition is pretty high, but there's a little bit extra dissonance that's unexpected, and it has a lot of changing meter, which is meaning that the... So it'll, it'll be like... It'll go from like 4-4 four, four for a measure to 5-8 to 3-8 to 2-4. Like the meter will change. So what happens is rhythmically you're getting all this variety. So you're getting a ton of variety in the case of, of the meter and the accents and the rhythm and t lots and lots of repetition in terms of, let's say, accompaniment pattern or, 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 or har har harmony but you might also get dissonance. So that's how they do it. Like the successful pieces by Philip Glass, by Steve Reich, they introduce variety in some way so that the repetition does not become so overwhelming to become boring. All right. Uh, asking a question, is there a book you would suggest with Bach chorales uh, with analyses? You know, I, I don't have one. Uh, that I can recommend. I, you know, I think there's a lot of things if you just do a Google search and look online where people have done it, but I don't have a, a particularly a good website that I, I, or a book that I'm like, I use this, uh, you know, highly recommended. At this point for me, I, I can just analyze them myself. I don't, I don't need a book, but for those who want to really study it and want to make, you know, like want to check your work, that would be something that would be very valuable. I'll keep my ear, ears open and if I find something, I will, I will post it in this video. All right. Can you explain how to use baseline to create direction or point some books or resources? Oh, okay. So baselines in terms of uh, 
the use of the baseline. So uh, that's a great question and a great follow-up question for, you know, connected to the Bach corral analysis. So the idea of a baseline um, is it goes into something I call the power of the scale. Specifically in the base is where that is most prominently found, right? So we have like... Eh, So think of a song like Sing me a song on the piano man Sing me a song to Right, so So we're going down the scale So this is, I'm doing it in C So C, B, A, G, F, E, D And then here we jump a fifth uh, Up, like, up a fourth So circle of fifths So two, five, one but that's scale. And the descending scale often is more powerful than the ascending. But both, uh, both of them work. But descending is the most powerful. Think about it uh, in like minor keys. You've heard this. Can kind of extend that whole idea. Um, it does. It do, It can happen in the soprano. Uh, there's an example that I've talked about in some of my earlier videos by Luca Morenzio. Uh, solo. Penso. Penso. I. I don't think this is correct, but it's something like that. Um, where the in the soprano it goes up a chromatic scale for like many measures and then it goes down a chromatic scale and you kind of like the ear picks up on the power of the scale and it allows you to ignore and it overrides I let me put it that way it overrides other rules that you would normally have to follow in terms of voice leading and chord progression because the ear latches onto the like the the inevitability of where that scale is going and that's what you latch onto as a listener that makes sense of things so let's say you were just going to be like let me see uh, let's say we go I'm doing all these weird chord progressions, but your ear is here. Your ear follows that, so it that's the thread that allows your ear to make sense of things. And then everything else kind of like is this kaleidoscope around the thread that makes things make sense. So let me see if I've how well I've gotten to to answering this question. Uh, so that was talking about a bass line, uh, but I'm, I mentioned how it, it also can be used. Uh, so I guess I didn't quite answer that question. Uh, to create direction. So the idea of direction can be the scale, using the scale and using passing tones, like the Bach example. So using passing tones to kind of go up and down scales. So scales, passing tones. The other is, um, so the bass line is kind of your harmonic foundation. And so anything that it does that kind of reinforces the circle of fifths is really going to give a lot of direction. So the circle of fifths is like the most direction oriented kind of progression. Um, t if you ever like take a, like a, a plastic tube and you spin it really fast, and then you slow down, and it goes. It basically goes down the overtone series. So you'll like you'll spin it fast, and like 
You might do something like you might go you might be spinning, and you hear this pitch, and then you spin a little slower, and then a little slower, a little slower, and then. But that, as you're going, that last perfect fifth, right there, is such a, a strong thing. Like it just feels like things are settling down. Like as your arm is slowing down, swinging the tube and getting the overtones. The last, like, kind of like, you'll get an octave at the bottom, but the, the last one with two different notes is a fifth. So it just feels like relaxation. It feels like things are bottom, relax. It's, 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 it's like part of a, an acoustic, a psychological and acoustic kind of like fact. So this idea of like things going, sounds like we're going towards something. We're going towards that goal of consonance or relaxation. So if you want to have a bass line that has direction, you know, three, six, two, five, one, you can have it jump around the circle of fifths and it will, it will sound like super direction. Now you can also have things kind of do the power of the scale thing where we're going, So you can use the scale as another way to have direction. So scale, circle of fifths, those are probably your two best bets um, in terms of doing that. In terms of resources and books, I, right now, I, I, you know, pretty much any uh, music theory, standard music theory text would work well. Tonal Harmony by Kostka and Payne is what I use in my classroom. Uh, and as I've mentioned on some of my other uh, videos, the... Harper Collins College Outlines are pretty darn good and very affordable. And they all kind of get you in, the, in that ballpark. You just want to kind of keep these, these, these concepts that I'm mentioning to you at the forefront of your mind. All right. What would... Uh... Okay. Well, you guys have so many good questions. I might have to save some of these for uh, for next time around. You guys are you guys are wearing me down. This is awesome. All right. So let me just do a quick quick and and I do apologize if I don't get to it. Listen, I do plan on doing another one in two weeks. Uh, I will write down some of these questions and I'll try to get to some of them. I won't be able to get to all of them, so please forgive me if I don't get to yours. But come back, ask again. That would be awesome. Uh, wouldn't the B, f okay, what about the alto B flat overlapping the soprano B flat in the second measure? Okay, I think this is probably referring to the Bach chorale. Uh, oh, maybe not. Mm. All right, choral tenor, I'm not quite sure. Uh, was this in the Bach chorale? Maybe it was. Why don't you type in at the bottom and I'll come back to you, uh, choral tenor. All right. Oh, no, that was Alex. Sorry. Oh, no, choral tenor. That B flat in measure two, B two, yeah. appoggiatura. Okay, I guess you guys have answered some of these questions on your own, which is awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, what is meant when a piece has no time signature and no bar line, such as Eric Satie? Uh, is there implied key signature? Well, um, Usually there's a couple reasons that happens. One is that it's meant to not feel metric. So think Gregorian chant um, where there was like there was not supposed to be a beat. And historically speaking, coming out of the Catholic Church, that made a lot of sense. The Catholic Church didn't want people tapping their toes and dancing in the aisles. The idea was that the the flesh, the body was sinful and it, the, the soul was what could be saved. So anything that emphasized the soul and the spirit and this kind of disembodied floating feeling would be very much desired. So when you talk about Eric Satie, in this time period, there's kind of a revival in medieval modes and uh, kind of the, the medieval sensibility. So the idea of experimenting with the more floating rhythms, the non-metric styles of music, uh, is something that Sati would probably have been very interested in. So I would imagine the idea is that uh, that there's probably not an implied 
time signature. It's probably meant to feel uh, more floating, like, like a medieval Gregorian chant. Now, I haven't studied that piece, so I'm not sure that's the correct evaluation. Um, I think you could, you could look and say, well, maybe there's some implied pacings. So sometimes composers like to leave more up to the performer to kind of decide and make it more their own. So that's another possibility. All right, uh, explain when you begin the harmonic progression. For example, if you have three, six, two, five, and then go to three, six, two, five, one. Um, please explain when you begin the harmonic progression. For example, if you have three, six, two, five, and then go. Ah, okay, I understand the question. So by when you don't, so that's a great question. So let me write it out for you. So you'll see things like this, three, six, two, five, three, six, two, five, one. And you're like, whoa, whoa, what happened to the five going to one here? How come five, where, right? You expect it like it does here. Expect five goes to one. There it is. When it, you kind of restart. So this has something to do with... Uh, so to, Danny was, was asking about chromatic chord substitutions, but there's diatonic chord substitutions as well. And three is a diatonic chord substitution for one. So if we say we're in C major, one would be C, E, G, and three would be E, G, B. You will notice that two thirds of the notes are the same. So it's not uncommon that you'll substitute three for a one chord in a place where you don't need a cadence and you don't need that strong resolution. This is super common in jazz. Uh, you know, so you might have three, six, two, five. And then you finally get to one. Right, so it's a way of, if it's a way, it's almost like, sometimes it feels like a, like a hiccup. So you're like, bump, bump, got, got, oh, back, 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 back. And you kind of, sometimes you'll just keep repeating that over and over, and it kind of generates this energy. Uh, so Miles Davis does that on, on one of his, on one of his songs on like, like, uh, I think on like, on If I Were a Bell, where it's just the, the three, six, two, five, three, six, two, five, three, six, two, five, three, six, two, five, and then you finally get to one, and you're like, yay, they made it, right? But they, they build the energy through that repetition. Um, keep in mind, you know, we have, we, we talk so much about harmonic progression and goal-oriented direction, but there is retrogression. There is going backwards, right? And it has an effect. You, you'll notice that it's minimal. If you look at the Bach chorale we started with, there's a, there's a, in the next phrase is a part where you have a retrogression that goes, um, let me just make sure, from four to six, right? It's usually the other way around, right? But Bach goes four to six. That's a retrogression. But it's so shocking because he's done progression, 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 expectation, expectation. When he does the opposite, a retrogression, it's like, boom, and it goes to this minor chord unexpectedly, and it, files, it feels powerful. So keep in mind that sometimes when you're doing these kind of harmonic progressions and you, you kind of, uh, you start it again, it's, there's, what's, the, what's the effect? And in that case, I think it's a matter of like, it's like a little hiccup that when you keep repeating it, it starts getting more energy, more energy, more energy. All right. Uh, tell us more about major, minor, seventh, seven degree chords. I'm going to put that one on hold, Jamie. I apologize. Uh, I would love to spend more time on that, but I'm going to wrap things up soon. Five doesn't go to three, but would it work if five is the half cadence and three is the beginning of a new phrase? That's another way it could happen, right? But think about how I, what I just did when I was doing five. Are we going three... <laughs> Here's five. I use the passing tone of the seventh going to move by step three. So. So that power of the scale, like kind of like almost like a reset. 
using the power to scale to reset me back to three. That's within the middle of a phrase. You're talking about half cadence and then starting on three as the beginning. That would work too. Uh, when we talk about modulation in the modulation lesson, we have, you know, kind of direct modulations. There's not all of them are smooth modulations that use a pivot chord. Some of them are more abrupt, and that would that could be an example of abrupt one. But it wouldn't be necessarily be three there. But it would almost feel like maybe it becomes the one of a of a new key. So context is really important. All right. Is there a software that checks SAPTV? Oh man, there's this guy uh, who sent me an email. I totally forgot I was going to mention this. Um, I'll have to mention that in my next one. So he he sent me. He has a he's a he's a French compo uh, not a French he's a French musician and computer programmer. And he's developed some software I think that does exactly this. Um, and he was asking about whether I wanted to employ this on some web pages I have. Uh, and I primarily do stuff through video, so I wasn't sure how that would be useful immediately. Um, I will post, I'll post in, in description of this uh, either later today or tomorrow about that. Uh, it, it doesn't, I don't know, if, I don't think it like checks it for errors. Man, oh, that would save me so much time in grading. Can you imagine where it's like, like Scantron for, for SATV writing where it's like, there's your parallel fifth, here's your overlapping, here's your voice crossing. Oh, it would save me so much time. That would be amazing. I should, I should partner with someone. I think music theory teachers all over the world would rejoice. Uh, okay, hey, from Romania. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for the birthday wishes, people. Love from Australia, love from Romania. I love it, I love it. Uh, helping people with their studies. That's always good. So question from Paul here. I understand that music theory is descriptive rather than prescriptive, which is a great point, right? Meaning it's describing what's working as opposed to telling you how you have to do something. Do you think Bach realized some of, some of off of these rules or was he creating the rules? You know, I think he was in large part, so he didn't, no one comes out of a vacuum. So he is creating some of the rules. He's creating them by listening to the music improvising in church like he played all the time like improvising in church and being like oh you know that improv i just did in church really worked why did it work because the one from last sunday wasn't so great like this is the dialogue he'd have with himself and the ones that really worked he would turn into compositions he would refine them and, and make so he would be listening and improvising and when he struck upon something that he said like that really works he would then analyze it and then elaborate and commit it so he's doing a lot that way, but he's also, you know, he's also studying the master. So he's studying Vivaldi. So Antonin Vivaldi before him, he's studying the, the, the Renaissance composers. So people like Palestrina. And so all of those kind of counterpoint, what we now study as part of species counterpoint, he's studying all of those rules, right? And so they got it from the medieval composers who got it from the, the Greek composers, you know, so there's, there's this long lineage, but at each point, uh, it's people listening and saying, ah, oh, this works or doesn't work. Uh, and, and another way to phrase that is this creates an emotion or this does not create an emotion. Um, and then the question is which emotion and can you control which emotion? And especially if you're having lyrics do the, do the emotions of the music align and complement the emotions of the words. Um, these are kind of the questions the composers are asking themselves. So I think that's a good point. I do think he was, he was in, in a large part, creating the rules uh, as well as following, you know, centuries-old rules. Uh, but he's creating some new ones as well. All right, thank you, thank you. Denmark, wonderful. <laughs> Stop <laughs> yelling at me, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't know what that means, but it's, it sounds funny. Uh, all right, microtone. Oh my goodness, Carl! Microtonal music. That's a whole other. That's a whole other amazing like area that is just like so big. It's like there's when you look into like medieval and Renaissance music theory, it's so much more complicated than you might first think. You're like, oh, it's it's some scales and modes. Got it. I know about scales and modes. 
It's so much more complicated than that. Uh, and microtonal music, where, where we're talking about, you know, we've got our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different pitches before we get to the octave, but there is a frequency between C and C sharp. I mean, there is a frequency there. So microtonal music is talking about dealing with some of those notes in between. So other cultures like India, their traditional music has notes that we would call microtonal. And composers in the 20th century, mid 20th century in the United States, uh, as well as other countries, do start kind of composing, combining Western European music traditions with microtonality. I don't know enough to talk about that. I, I mean, I've, I, I just, I would, I would, I would have to do some serious research to really be able to speak with any kind of insight into that area. But interesting. Uh, negative modes. That's actually something I have started looking into. Um, I have started looking to again some of these things some of the things that I look into are are things I already know but with new names right so uh, but I have looked into like kind of like the descending scales and how you flip it up I, I don't know enough yet to talk well but it's on my list of things to learn more about more like we're all learning stuff or we all should be learning right the idea of learning being a lifelong process I Absolutely intend that to be the case for myself. Always try to learn something new. Uh, and negative modes is on the list. So, Carl, I might get back to you on that one. All righty. Uh, all right. So, I'm going to so I'm gonna ask Coral Tenor. I'm going to answer your question. And, and then everyone else, please, I apologize if I didn't get to your question. But we're over two hours in. I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to fade out on you and not have good answers and good, good insights. So, uh, the second measure of the second part of the Bach chorale. Second measure of the second part. Um, okay, so there wasn't any voice crossing there. Let me, sh let me re rewrite that on the board and just point out. And if, if I'm mistaken, you can type in the chat. I will answer that. Um, so let me put that back up there for you. Second measure. And correct me if I'm wrong. I think I know which spot you're referring to, and I think I know why there's a little confusion there. And it has more to do with like different note values and when things actually are like hitting the same pitch. So voice crossing is when they actually go over or under. When they become the same pitch, that's fine as long as they then diverge and don't stay on the same pitch. So I believe we're talking about this measure where we have a dotted quarter B flat and then the soprano moves to that exact B flat and then the alto moves to an A flat eighth note and then we get this. These are eighth notes here. So, choral tenor, tell me if I'm right or wrong. Is that where you're, is that where you're referring to? Um, so just let me know. If, that, if this is it, if this is what you're talking about, this is not voice crossing because at this moment right here, they're, they're doing the same note. And we know that in choral writing, you can have something that looks like this, where it's like the soprano and the alto are both singing the exact same pitch. They're going to like, they might come together like this, this, and then they're going to go apart or oblique motion or something. They're not going to stay on the same note, but they can kind of come, hit the same note, and then kind of part ways again. And that's what you have here. So it's not voice crossing at no point. So this soprano note is not below what this alto note is. Nor is this alto note higher than this soprano note. So you actually don't have voice crossing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the that's the thing. It just looks so different, right? Because of the way that note hits. But this is not an example of voice crossing. This is an, actually an example of Bach following the rules 100%. We have, and then, right? So if I go alto soprano, alto soprano, alto soprano, alto soprano.
All right, I like that. That's a good place to end. We started with Bach, and we end with Bach. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Uh, I'm, I'm embarking on my next, my next year of adventure in music theory. I hope you will join me, uh, hopefully, two weeks from now, on Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll be talking about some Royal Academy of Music questions for Theory 8, Grade 8. Uh, and then I will open it up to questions. I'm going to keep a, I'm going to try to keep a list of some of these questions I didn't get to and be able to throw some of those in a, as well. If I forget, please sign in and ask again. Take, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.